I was a professor of MBA, so I would say, yeah. That was what I would say. I don't know the title. Yeah? I don't know the title. Oh, you can say doctor. Yeah. Uh, hey. Good morning. I, I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. At least uh, you know, the air conditioning unit can, can support the, the, the Yeah, 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 yeah. They will, they will, they will provide everything, and it's and you have the mouse, and then you can, you can click there. You can see the presentation. Good morning, everyone. I think we can get start. Um, welcome to the hydroacoustics and physical properties of the ocean session. My name is Georgios Haralabus. I'm from the International Monitoring System at CTBTO, and together with uh, my colleague Peter Nielsen from the International Data Center, uh, we will chair this session. Um, it's an extremely interesting session, as you will see uh, by yourselves. Uh, let, me, uh, let me summarize today's hydroacoustic activities because some of them are not very well illustrated in the program. So we have uh, between 9 and 11, we have our hydroacoustic session, two invited uh, uh, presentations and four contributed papers. At the end of that, we will have one minute presentation for each uh, poster uh, that will be displayed in the first sal. And then um, we break for coffee. During the lunch break, we will have here in the same room three presentations regarding the HA04 installation at Crozet. We did not want to include those um, <coughs> presentations uh, in the main program because then there would, wouldn't be any time for, for uh, the external participants. So please, uh, if you are interested in, uh, uh, in learning more about this exciting uh, project that came into conclusion uh, in December uh, last year, uh, please uh, join us again uh, uh, during lunch break, and uh, there will be three uh, very interesting presentations here. For those who cannot make it today, the same three presentations will be offered in the H04 exhibition room at the other end of the, of the corridor, again during the lunch break tomorrow. Okay. Um, And with that, I think we are ready to uh, start our presentation. The first speaker is Professor Kaneda, and he will present uh, real-time monitoring data application simulation research for earthquake and tsunami disaster mitigation. Professor Kaneda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Harara uh, Sam. Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to talked uh, about uh, this uh, title, uh, the real-time uh, monitoring data application and simulation research for the earthquake uh, tsunami disaster mitigation. So, okay. I'd like to talk about uh, the, this uh, the presentation focus on the Nankai Trap, uh, the southwestern part of Japan. It's a very severe problem. The megastructure earthquake over magnitude H class uh, earthquake uh, occurred every uh, 100 to 200 years. 
it's a very severe problem for uh, Jap Japan, yes. So, uh, for the uh, preparation of the, for the disaster mitigation, uh, Japanese government already uh, deployed the ZooNet system. It's a real-time monitoring system of the offshore, uh, ocean floor network system. And around here, oh, around here. So, next, next slide. Uh, before, uh, you know the, the 2011 Tokyo earthquake, uh, before uh, this earthquake, uh, uh, the ocean floor deformation already uh, occurred around here. So this is a, a result of the uh, record uh, by the pressure gauges. It's very important information uh, to the, uh, uh, the how to uh, get the precursor uh, the, the before the megaslash earthquake. So real time monitoring is very, very important. So next slide. DUNET uh, has uh, three main uh, objectives. One is the early detection of the earthquake tsunamis. Uh, second is the contribution of the prediction researches. And the third is the development of the advanced ocean floor uh, observation. So I'd like to uh, sorry. <laughs> Just moments. <laughs> Or this one? Hmm? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yes. This is a, a, a recent seismic in Japan using the high net and the uh, ocean floor network system. Uh, day by day, you can understand the uh, seismicity uh, the, uh, around Japan. It's very, very Im significant information that how to, uh, the, where the earthquake occurred around Japan. This is just a uh, real-time monitoring system uh, result. So next slide. I'd like to talk about the DUNET. So uh, the, probably some people already know the DUNET system. This is uh, the uh, long-term borehole and long-term borehole observatories. Uh, DUNET has a uh, uh, very, very nice uh, functions so to observe the long-term uh, uh, observation uh, to uh, understand the uh, Nankai Trough Megathrust earthquake uh, occurrence mechanism and the early warning earthquake and the tsunamis. So using the uh, broadband and uh, strong motion and uh, pressure gauges and uh, uh, differential pressure gauges, hydrophone and uh, some meters. So we already completed the development of the DUNET 1, 2. Totally the observatories are uh, 51 observatories. Yes. So uh, DUNET is a, a, a very nice function that using the node, science node. It uh, uh, extends the uh, observatories and the sensors. It's a very, very important uh, function in the DUNET here. So this is our, uh, the uh, sensing system to monitor the cluster activity in the real time. They're using the, the seismometers in the buried in the sea floor. So the pressure gauges and the, on the sea floor here. This is a more detailed information on the real time monitoring system in the Nankai Trough, the DUNET A. Uh, this is a, uh, one is a DUNET 1, second is a DUNET 2. The two do uh, uh, real time monitoring around the Tom Nankai seismogenic zone and the Nankai seismogenic zone. So this is a background seismicity detected by DUNET. So you, you can see the very high a seismicity, but not so large earthquake. A magnitude of one, two, uh, sometimes three uh, earthquake occurred around here. But uh, before doing the uh, deployment, uh, not so many earthquakes uh, detected by the only land observatories. This is a. Uh, I'd like to t talk about it. Last year, the uh, April first uh, earthquake occurred around here. It's just uh, on the DUNET array. I would, just, I'd like, I would like to show you, this is a record of by DUNET. Yes, 
It's just across to the uh, half center is very close to the Dunet array. This is a record of Dunet. So actually, the, we can uh, monitor the, uh, the, this record at, uh, after the, just after earthquake occurred. So next slide here. This is a uh, uh, depth of distribution of the background size mist here. This is a, a, a compression of the uh, location with the reflection profile. It's just a, a Philippine separate boundary here. It's almost uh, as a, a, a occurred around, along to the uh, Philippine separate boundary. And it's very, very significant, important information to understand next mega thrust earthquake of the uh, Nankai trough. So this is a, uh, this earthquake almost uh, activate very low frequency uh, events. So this is a main shock. Aftershock is a little bit uh, far uh, from the main shock, and uh, very low frequency event is occurred. It's very significant uh, the phenomenon. So this is just the result of the Zunet uh, observation. Next slide. Uh, this is, uh, I would like to show the Fukushima earthquake at uh, la last, uh, last November. Yes, uh, occurred magnitude 7.4 here. This is a record of uh, DUNET. Yes, you can see the DUNET here. So you can understand the sensitivity of the DUNET. Yes, next slide. So I would like to show the other uh, the, uh, uh, behavior of the DUNET uh, record. This is a uh, Just a moment. Okay. Yes. At the talk earthquake, the already the Dunet Observatory, ten observatories are deployed around here. This is a, a animation of the using the Dunet pressure gauge record. How to uh, behave a sea floor at the talk earthquake? It uh, means a tsunami behavior. Okay, next slide. So, uh, one more slide. I would like to the, uh, the importance of the DUNET uh, real-time monitoring system uh, combined to the simulation researches. This is a real-time inundation simulation using the DUNET uh, the tsunami uh, database. This is just a simulation. If, occur, if uh, DUNET sensor uh, detects the earthquake the tsunamis, uh, especially the tsunamis, so we already prepared the tsunami database and compare to the, uh, the real, real time record to, and the uh, uh, tsunami database, we can see, yes, we already uh, predict the tsunami inundation just before the tsunami arrival. Yes, this is very important information. How to rescue, how to uh, escape uh, from a tsunami. So this is a very important uh, the information using the DUNET real-time data and uh, advanced simulation researches. Next slide. I'd like to show you this one. The DUNET 1 and DUNET 2 is uh, uh, already deployed around here. So. This is just the image of the before Nankai trough earthquake. How, the, how do they deform, displace the ocean floor before Nankai trough mega thrust earthquake? This is just the record of the simulation here. Next slide. I'd like to see the another uh, uh, the research using the DUNET data. This is a, a Tohoku earthquake data. This is a Tohoku earthquake. And uh, this is a, a result of the collaboration of the uh, Moscow uh, State of University. Yes. This is a, a gravity wave the, before the uh, tsunami arrival. This is a very important information here. here. So 
This is a low frequency uh, component variation in the bottom pressure recorded by doing it one station. Uh, th this is a very important information. This is uh, the next slide. So next slide, I'd like to the advanced uh, tsunami simulation uh, 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 result. This is a Jagras uh, 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 application. It is a detail uh, here. As you know, the, the Tohoku earthquake, you, you can see this is a Tohoku earthquake as many as a wave, tsunami wave uh, come. And not, uh, not one wave, many uh, tsunami wave come. Why so, so many tsunami wave come? So this is a, this phenomena, no, phenomena is a nonlinear dispersed wave. I would like to sh show you the here. Yes, this is a simulation. You can see this one. Yes, this one. This is a just a nonlinear dispersed uh, phenomenon in the tsunami simulation. It's similar uh, and consistent with a, a real record of the Tohoku earthquake tsunami. Yes, next slide. This is a, uh, you can see this one, this one, this one. Uh, please compare to the, uh, the resolution. Uh, the, this is a nonlinear. Uh, this is a uh, this is a linear. This is a nonlinear, and uh, this pass uh, uh, simulation result. Next slide. So I'd like to show you that uh, in the far field tsunamis, usually generally the, uh, the tsunami uh, amplitude and the arrival time uh, quite different with the observ observation and the simulation. So uh, this is an example of the red color is observation, and the uh, uh, blue, uh, blue uh, color is a, uh, so, sorry, red color is a simulation, and the uh, black and blue is a, uh, observation data. You can see the how the difference uh, from between them. But using the uh, uh, geographic uh, governing equations, including the elastic loading and the uh, uh, sea water uh, density uh, classification, it's very, very important. Next slide. This is a, uh, uh, please compare the business without uh, the uh, elastic loading and the density classification. Uh, quite a difference, observation and uh, simulation. However, including elastic loading the density classification, you can compare to the uh, uh, observation and the simulation. More clear, this is here. Red is observation, green is the simulation result. You can see it's almost sim uh, similar in the, uh, the arrival time and amplitudes. It's very, very important in information. How to evaluate uh, the tsunami uh, arrival and the tsunami amplitude? This is uh, just an uh, advanced tsunami simulation. And uh, integrate real time monitoring and uh, using the, this uh, advanced tsunami simulation application is very, very important. So the uh, tsunami disaster mitigation. Next slide. We can combine the real time monitoring data and uh, uh, tsunami uh, simulation application. So uh, from now, we, uh, we always apply this uh, geographic tsunami simulation and real time monitoring by DUNET, uh, DUNET 1 and 2, or the other real time monitoring system data. Next slide. This is a very, very severe problem. The landslide tsunami is, is very, very severe. It's very difficult to evaluate uh, the uh, tsunami uh, uh, detection. So this is a, a simulation, yes? This is a landslide, yes, in the Marmara Sea. Yes. Next. I will show you the, some. Oosh. Tsunami simulation by landslide in the, in the Marmara Sea. This is a result of the Satellips project between the Japan and the Turkey. 
Uh, this is a, a landslide tsunami simulation. Yes, this is a very, very important information. The, in the Marmara Sea, the, the North Anatolian Fault are, are, are around here. So if occurred a strong motion uh, earthquake, the, uh, generate the landslide, probably the, these tsunami uh, will uh, uh, generate it around the uh, Marmara Sea. This is just the result of the uh, landslide tsunami simulation. Yes. So, real time monitoring is very, very important to detect landslide tsunamis. Next slide. I'd like to show the Japanese uh, real time monitoring system. Uh, the inland is a high net and K net uh, already uh, uh, deployed around here. Now, uh, after uh, Tohoku earthquake, the S net is around here. And uh, before Tohoku earthquake, already uh, do net and uh, here, oh, do net uh, around here, and now we are discussing uh, the uh, the next ocean floor network uh, the, to cover the western part of the Nankai Trough Megathrust earthquake seismic zone. It's just uh, uh, under discussion with, uh, in the uh, Japanese government. So next slide. I would like to show uh, the SNET. So this is a, a SNET is a subsystems network uh, segment. Here, yeah, this is a uh, image of the do, uh, SNET inline system. This next slide. This is a more detailed the sensors uh, the installed in the each observation node. Node means uh, the in, in the inline here. So this is the just inline uh, system, but quite different from the DoNet. DoNet is uh, using the node, science node, to ex extend the sensors and observations. So, so this is a, a, a Fukushima earthquake uh, record by SNET. Next slide. So, uh, this is uh, the, uh, I would like to show you again in the Japanese real time monitoring system around the uh, inland system and the offshore. Uh, the real time network system, SNET and the DUNET here. Yes. Now, just uh, the, uh, we are discussing about uh, the next ocean floor network system around the western part of the uh, Nankai Trough Seismic Zone. It's uh, just uh, uh, SNET inline system on the DUNET system or the uh, hybrid uh, SNET and DUNET system, just uh, under discussion here. This is uh, just uh, the real-time monitoring in Japan, system in Japan. So, yes. So finally, I would like to uh, close my talk. Uh, this uh, real-time monitoring is very, very important and uh, science and the disaster mitigation. And uh, especially the, uh, the, uh, this real-time monitoring system is uh, uh, international collaboration is very, very important for the science and the disaster mitigation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Kaneda. Uh, we have time for questions, so a small discussion on uh, what Professor Kaneda presented. Any comments, any questions from the audience? Yes. It seems there's a gap between the Nankai coverage and the Tohoku coverage around Tokyo. Yes. Is, is they're thinking that there's not enough big earthquakes there, or? Yes. Or what? Uh, can I show the slide, last slide, uh, before, before last slide? Oh. oh OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Just a moment. <clears throat> Thank you, Bruce. I'd like to show you here. Yes. Oh. Hmm? All right. <laughs> just a moment. Yes. SNET is a, it's just an image, but actually the sensor are covered around here by SNET. 
So, so uh, it's it a little bit uh, gap, but a small uh, network of, of the, uh, by the need is already deployed, very small uh, network uh, with uh, uh, seismometers and pressure gauges. But uh, SNET covered around here. Okay. Yes. Okay. Hmm. But uh, I would like to uh, deploy the more uh, dense array around the off Tokai area. It's very, very important. Is it okay? Thank you. Any other question? Any other comment? I have one. Yes. Um, Professor Kaneda, could you please tell us uh, how much the tsunami warning uh, time was reduced since you installed the, the DUNET and the SNET uh, observatories in, in Japan? Yes, it, it depends on the high percent of the tsunami location. But uh, the generally, the, the DUNET, uh, it's very close to the uh, coastline. But uh, t probably the 10 minutes on the, is uh, more reduced the advanced time. But SNET is a uh, Generally, the tsunami is a little bit far uh, from the coastline. So, uh, 15 minutes or the 20 minutes is uh, reduced. Okay? Thank you very uh, much. Yes. This is very important. And not only the tsunami warning, to uh, using the some simulation and real time inundation uh, simulation is very, very important. But, uh, especially the uh, administrative uh, uh, group and the rescue groups. Mm. Thank you very much. So, thank you. So with that, we can proceed to the, the next speaker. Next speaker is Professor Howe, and he will present uh, smart cables. And the title of the presentation is Smart Cable Sensing the Pulse of the Planet. Yes, so I'll... Bruce, the floor is yours. I'll discuss this uh, uh, relatively new project. Um, we're in the concept phase. Uh, SMART stands for Science Monitoring and Reliable Communication. And this is kind of a, a summary slide. It's a little busy, but I'll, I'll walk through it. Um, the basic idea, we, we want to make measurements to address climate, ocean circulation, earthquakes, tsunamis, and, and with a global array. The basic idea is to use uh, telecommunication infrastructure and then add sensors to it. Um, so these cables are spanning the ocean between continents. They provide the internet that our civilization depends on. Um, and every 50 to 100 kilometers, there's a repeater. Here's, here's, here's a repeater going in the ocean from a cable ship. And at that repeater, there could be a small amount of electric power and, and communication capability. Um, so the basic point is to add science to the telecom mission for these cables. Um, they're roughly a gigameter or, or um, a million kilometers of cable out there now with 10,000 repeaters. and. There's typically a 10 or 20 year refresh time uh, for technology purposes. Uh, the cables actually last 25 years or longer. Um, so the idea is that uh, we routinely install these sensors on new cables as they are deployed. And then over 10, 20, 30 years, we build up a global spanning uh, array. Um, initially, we would measure bottom pressure, temperature, and acceleration. and Perhaps later we could add other different sensors. Um, this is based on a uh, Nature News article written by John Yu in 2010, Harnessing Telecom Cables for Science. Uh, this is our current uh, sort of cartoon of how we see this being implemented uh, in a technical way. So here's, here's a repeater, um, and, and a, we bring out a second small cable, wrap it around over a 20 meter length to a second sensor module. And then uh, we put sensors around the cable, but 
in this module, we're not penetrating into the cable. It's, it's, it's around the cable, and therefore, um, in this modality, it can be deployed by a cable ship with no change in, in procedures. Um, so if we can do this, uh, these smart cables would be a first order addition to the ocean and earth observing system with the unique contributions that will complement and strengthen uh, satellite and in situ systems. Um, so as I said, we're, we're, uh, we really want to make measurements that can inform us about climate change, ocean, including ocean temperature and ocean circulation. And these have direct impact on, on, on society. Um, sea level rise and then disaster warning, uh, tsunami sensing and earthquake monitoring uh, throughout ocean basins. Um, this project started, uh, well, that article was written in 2010 and in 2012, uh, the um, International Telecommunication Union, an agency of the United Nations, uh, joined together with the World Meteorological Organization and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission uh, to form this joint task force of interested individuals and organizations. So we have roughly 120 members uh, and representing 80 organizations, um, most, almost all volunteer. Uh, so this is still in the concept development phase. Um, and, and the purpose of this task force is to raise awareness and educate and publicize the concept, uh, find money, that's really the main, the main task, uh, collaborate for a universal solution, um, and educate governments to facilitate permits and funding, and, and to use this new form of data when it comes available, and link with other global initiatives, including CTBTO and other international agencies. There are various reports on the web page, engineering, legal, uh, a strategy roadmap report, and, and a science uh, and society report. We're, as I said, at a concept stage now, and we're, we're making plans for a wet demonstration and or a pilot uh, project. I just want to show one uh, uh, slide uh, showing some, some climate-related things uh, um, and, and really just highlight that, well, we, we, we know some unknowns. Uh, and there are obviously some other unknown unknowns out there we, we're, we're not even aware of. But these are some of the things that, that have really only been discovered, if you will, over the last decade or two. Um, this, this comes from a uh, science article uh, a couple of months ago showing new uh, physical phenomena occurring on, on the Greenland ice sheet and elsewhere. Um, that accelerates the melting of ice. So basically, uh, there's, in some one way or another, there's little patches of dirt that form on the ice, uh, air pollution particles, and so on. And then they absorb more sunlight, they heat up, uh, bacteria and algae start growing, and that makes a little pit in the ice, which gets darker and absorbs more heat, and so on. And this turns out to be a major influence on, on melting ice. And of course, there's um, then uh, rivers forming on top of the ice sheets also. And I'll, I'll sh this be a video in a minute. This is from the Arctic uh, sea ice uh, versus time. So this goes back to 1978. Here we are, 2017. This is from the... Uh, Polar Science Center at APLUW. Uh, so if, if you just do a simple extrapolation, in 16 years there'll be no, no sea ice left in the Arctic. Um, let's see, I think. So this is Antarctica, and it's been known that there are these rivers Okay. <laughs> that there are these uh, rivers forming on top of the ice and they eat down through the ice and help break up the ice and, and make it flow faster. So, but in, in that slide, they, 
it's realized now that is happening all the way around Antarctica and very close to the South Pole itself. Um, okay, so as we develop this concept, this project, um, these are some of the activities we've, that have been occurring. Uh, so we've, we've held workshops uh, sponsored by NASA for the climate and ocean circulation aspects and then at, at Geoforcing Centrum in, in Potsdam, uh, there was a workshop last uh, November on the tsunami and earthquake aspects. And there's modeling in progress uh, on these topics. And I'll go through some of these uh, in the next slides. Um, first, though, just looking at ocean circulation uh, and sea level, um, there are different ways of, of measuring uh, sea level and, and ocean circulation. Uh, space uh, satellites are, are a huge asset in this respect with altimeters and gravity measurements. Um, as the ocean warms up, it expands because of thermal reasons and that forms a sea surface height anomaly. Then as ice melts off land, uh, new, new mass is being added to the ocean and that affects both the the sea, sea level height as well as uh, gravity. And so ocean bottom pressure sensors would be very useful there to understand ocean circulation. Water flows from high pressure to low pressure um, as well as the uh, connections between the temperature, salinity, and uh, pressure. So the basic idea here is we're adding a new component to this observing system uh, with the bottom cables. Another way of looking at this is, is using one of these diagrams that shows different, different processes as a function of time and space. Here we're going from one second to a thousand years, one meter to a hundred kilometers. And here we have different observing systems. Argo, these drifting floats that go around, sample from a couple hundred kilometers and, and larger scale from a day and longer scale, uh, or 10, 10 days actually, 20 days. Um, altimetry, somewhat more rapid. And then smart cables actually includes all these scales. So from tsunamis, tides, up to all the uh, uh, climate, seasonal and climate variation. Um, so, by measuring temperature, we can learn more about the spatial and temporal variability of deep ocean temperatures and track the heat flow through the ocean along the boundaries. Bottom pressure tells us, again, temporal variability of waves, tides, and currents, and especially the, the higher frequency, the shorter time scale uh, processes. And then also sea level and obviously constrained tsunami amplitudes. Uh, and acceleration measurements would improve earthquake parameters informing us about the solid earth. Uh, Tony Song at JPL Caltech is presently putting together a uh, what's called a mission simulator in, in NASA speak and using a model uh, 30 layers going over uh, almost 60 years uh, terrain following quarter degree, 25 kilometer scale. Um, so some of the variables he, he outputs are the sea surface height and ocean bottom pressure. And this gives an idea of, of the, that kind of variability. This is daily, daily plot shown here. Um, and then in Potsdam, uh, Tobias Weber and Mike Thomas are putting together what's called observing system simulation experiments. Um, so you start off with, with truth, model runs that represent what you've defined as truth, and, and do data simulation and produce a, um, your simulating data, and produce a map, and then you have a control run and you compare these two to see what the improvement is as you add data. Um, so these, there, there are different forms of these kind of experiments and one has to be very careful about assumptions and, and so on. And these are just a very, very preliminary results, so just keep that in mind. Um, so uh, here's, uh, as a function of depth, the uh, improvement in percent for velocity and temperature 
this is entire globe, and this is in the north, in the in the entire Pacific, which is really about half half the ocean volume. Um, and there's in in the Pacific about a 40 percent improvement uh, with in temperature, and again temperature. In, in these models, it, it's all intimately tied with pressure as well. Um, and then velocity, there's some improvement. So in the next, in the next uh, steps uh, this summer and, and beyond, they'll do a fraternal twin experiment. These, these are identi identical twin experiments. They come from the same model. In this case, uh, Tony Song's model output will be ingested into this model at Potsdam. And, and these same calculations made. And then next would be a coupled atmosphere ocean uh, simulation, which will be very informative because really um, the, the coupling between atmospheric pressure changes and ocean circulation is, is very intimate and, and we hopefully will, will see that in these simulations. Next um, two slides on, on the earthquake aspects, I want to acknowledge Charlotte Rowe here. Uh, she provided uh, these, these figures and, and text. Um, so in, in seismology, there, there are two fundamental link problems. One is estimating the, the location, size, and, and site characters, characteristics of a seismic source. And then usually the next step is to try and then uh, determine the properties within the earth um, using those seismic wave uh, data to do whole earth tomography as, as one example. And from this, this process, one can learn about tectonics, uh, the uh, viscosity of the earth, uh, mineralogy, and economic potential, and, and so on. Um, but when, when doing these large-scale inversions, one quickly sees that there's a large part of the earth that we, we cannot resolve. Um, that's all this white area is, is unresolved structure or unknown structure in the earth and, and that's largely over the oceans where we have very little data. Um, so in this case, uh, Charlotte and, and students have, have looked at, hmm, this got cut off here a bit. Um, this, this is, these are ray paths given, given uh, one or two earthquakes and then uh, with the existing observation system and then this is what one obtains when you you have these green these these smart cables this is in the Pacific these green lines represent cables here like this and this shows a, a section through the earth a cut through the earth showing that much more coverage uh, here all the white area shows there's there are very few rays going through those areas um, so this is uh, in a, uh, shown in a poster, um, and it's, it's um, I think it's accepted or almost accepted. <laughs> um, okay, so then lastly, uh, tsunamis. Uh, where do we need to measure? Well, the rim of fire, obviously. Um, uh, these, these heavy lines sort of represent nominal cable routes, but uh, Obviously, a lot of mega thrust earthquakes in these areas. Then down here, there's still earthquakes and tsunami risk, obviously. By the way, these, these points are dart buoys, which are uh, about 60 of them around the world, uh, very expensive to maintain uh, and subject to vandalism in some places. So one would like to uh, improve the reliability of, of, of the tsunami uh, detection system uh, using using smart cables. Uh, so Stu Weinstein and, and colleagues uh, um, at the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center have done simulations in this regard. So here are some, some nominal cable paths. Uh, these are uh, hoped for cables in the future. These are would be representing existing routes. Um, and what they've done is each of these circles represents a hypothetical possible earthquake location. Um, and then the, the color represents the time it takes uh, before an earthquake at that location is detected by three sensors. 
Um, so it's on the order of hours here. The short time, time scale here because sensors are close to earthquake locations, but, but larger times here. Um, and then this is, this is with, with sensors just 500 kilometer spacing, not the hope for more like 100 kilometer spacing. Um, so this is quantified here, just taking an average over all of those that there's a uh, roughly a 30 minute improvement uh, uh, by including the cables, a 30 minute reduction in, in morning time. So as, as Stu says, there's been tremendous progress since the recent large earthquakes and tsunamis and uh, with a few smart cables, we can determine the seism seismogenic epicenters by 20%, speed up the time to that determination, and then also uh, characterize ocean crossing tsunamis by 25% reduction in, in time for more rapid assessment. Um, so as he says, uh, imagine the effect of many cables with, with one-tenth the spacing in the uh, sensors. So what's some other progress, uh, ITU issued a RFI for a mechanical wet demonstration project last December and we're still collecting responses for that. Uh, I'll discuss these two, RFP for New Caledonia for cable and then Tsunami Act. There are two other projects I just note, there, there are others too that are related. Uh, there's now a deep ocean observing strategy project sitting under Goose Global Ocean Observing System. And the goal of this project is to lay out the strategy for how to observe the deep ocean, uh, extending Argo floats deeper, um, and especially in, in this case, emphasizing more biological and chemical measurements. But I expect that smart cables could play a, a distinct role in this as it moves forward. And then also, um, a lot of the motivation here is driven by the potential for uh, starting deep ocean uh, seafloor mining, and that's administered by the International Seabed Authority. So there's motivation there to make more measurements in the deep ocean. Let me just say a few words about this uh, request for proposal uh, issued by the Office of Post and Telecommunications in New Caledonia. Uh, for a cable from New Caledonia to Fiji. These are two possible cable routes. Um, this is, would be a, well, first of all, in, in that RFP, there is an option for the smart capability. So they're requesting companies to respond to that particular option with a, with a, a proposal. Um, and then uh, this is nearly ideal for a pilot uh, system for the smart cable concept. It's in a location with high earthquake and tsunami threat uh, with interesting oceanography. The project itself, I mean, the, the OPT managers and so on, they, they would like to see this for the societal benefit. Um, it's modest scale, maybe 20 repeaters. It's between friendly countries, uh, with, so fewer permitting legal issues, and uh, it's, <coughs> funded by the French government, so there are fewer commercial considerations. And uh, it's plausible that we, the science and early warning community, can raise the incremental cost, and that's, that's the deal with OPT. Um, and then also in this area, the dart buoys, there, there are a couple around here, and those are very expensive to maintain. So NOAA is interested, and NOAA is responsible for that. Uh, and they're, they would like to see an alternative to, to the buoys. Um, so, and, and, and this would demonstrate the complete capability of the concept. Um, the second uh, step of progress, uh, the U.S. Congress and the President signed a, a Tsunami Warning Education and Research Act of 2017 this was tied to a weather bill, non-controversial <laughs> uh, bill. Um, but it basically authorized NOAA to look into the feasibility of using commercial submarine telecommunication cables 
and federal ones, uh, if practicable, pract practical for uh, tsunami uh, purposes. And so NOAA, it doesn't authorize new money for NOAA to do this, but it allows NOAA to use existing funding if they so choose to, to start the process. And then furthermore, it, it, it hopefully will positively influence other agencies in our U.S. federal government to be more supportive of this concept. Um, there are some technical challenges. Uh, in some ways, the mechanical aspects are easy to solve. The connectivity into the repeater is a little more difficult. There's 10,000 volts you have to worry about. And then also, um, it, it's, it's a little, uh, uh, well, they're, they're transmitting terab terabytes of data, terabits of data per second along the fibers, yet we only want maybe 10 kilobits per second or something, and it's, it's actually hard to, to jump on that super highway. Uh, but those, the, the companies say they can, they can solve that. Um, and so the lower impact, uh, any changes are the, the better. Um, we do need the wet demonstration and pilot projects or, or hybrids thereof. Just note that there was a proposed system in 2012 and the companies actually were ready to, to do this. So from a technical point of view, it can be done. So summarizing, um, so the science and society needs are clear and, and they continue to be, be there. Um, there is science consensus as demonstrated through these white papers and the workshops and uh, publications are starting um, and there is ongoing modeling and this, this is essential to quantifying the cost benefit. Um, the companies are not willing to invest money in this non-recurring engineering until they see that there is a long-term market and, and desire for this capability. Um, on the other hand, technical solutions are tractable. There are some legal issues, but again, uh, those are likely solvable. Um, we need to increase our interaction with sponsors, governments, UN, and so on. And get more community uh, and user buy-in. It all comes down to funding, so that's what I'm working on uh, this summer, <laughs> trying to try to find funding. Uh, so just uh, summarize: we're really working towards a much denser global array uh, coverage for ocean, climate, earthquake, and tsunamis, and. Uh, these future, planned and future sensors could contribute to the CTBT mission. Um, and this complements both the smart cable uh, project and the CTBT uh, desire to interact with, with uh, or, or participate in these treaties and, and the requirements thereof. So I'll just leave it there. You can look at that a little more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions, comments for Professor Howe? Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Howe, I was uh, wondering if this concept can be used to um, have mid-term or short-term solutions for a dysfunctional hydroacoustic station. Can you essentially get a hitch a hike from this cable that we're talking about and uh, set up a uh, temporary hydroacoustic stations uh, until once become available that you can, you can construct a uh, stationary hydroacoustic system. Given the fact that hydroacoustic systems would have to have the 100% uh, data availability uptime, is it possible? Uh, well, first, um, many of us would like to see hydrophones as, as the core sensors. They were uh, sort of postponed till phase two because of possible military political issues, um, which I think are actually a non-issue, but that, that doesn't change this, the situation. Um, from a technical point of view, um, yes, one, one could use the same technology. The, the, 
advantage of having a separate sensor module is that's a, a relatively clean interface and you could in principle put any sensor you want on the end of that, that system. Um, whether it would be adequate for, for CTBT purposes, I mean, it's on the seafloor and, um, you know, the, the, the concept here is this is done over a long time period, you know, as new systems are put in. Uh, so, I, I, it's, it's not clear, I, I guess is one answer. Um, one could envision that on the end or, or in that sensor module, you might have an underwater mateable connector and you could attach something to it, which might address your, your um, desire uh, need. Thank you. Uh, I would like to um, echo uh, Professor Howe's concerns about that, but besides the, the political and uh, issues, I would like to remind uh, everyone that the um, hydrophones of the cable stations of the international monitoring system are suspended in the water column in the software channel they are not situated on the on the seafloor and uh, you know for for obvious reasons because they they have to offer huge uh, coverage uh, in the world oceans and i don't think we can manage the same coverage with um, uh, sea bottom um, hydrophones. Now, whether an external module can be attached to it and then we can become, um, well, the whole concept of smart cables then gets into phase three, I think, not phase two. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I mean it, would be, it would be great. It would be really fantastic if we managed to do that. Yeah. But uh, we have to go through phase one and phase two first right. before right. we go to that. The, the whole idea is to keep it simple and, and, and sort of mass produce it and so on at the beginning at least, you know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we have three, four minutes. Um, if you have any questions for both invited speakers or any comments in that respect, um, we have time to entertain them, please. If not, then let me, let me remind for those who came uh, a bit late into the session that uh, during the lunch break, we will have a uh, presentation of um, uh, HO4 uh, in, this, in this room. So we have three presentations for the installation of the hydroacoustic station HO4. Um, it's not in the program, but there is a quick screen that uh, outside that um, announces that. And for those who cannot make it today during lunch break for the HO4 presentations, tomorrow also we will have the same presentations, but not here, but in the HO4 uh, exhibition room, which is exactly on the other, the other end of the corridor. And you have not visited. Uh, I highly recommend that you visit that. It's a, it's a very interesting exhibition room. So with that, I think we can prepare for the next speaker. So, Peter, Absolutely. it's up to you. Thank you so much, Chairman. It's a pleasure for me to announce the following contributing papers for this mor in this morning session. And um, the first paper is um, produced by Hannes Sagen and uh, her co-authors, co-authors, and the title is Acoustic Characteristics of the Fram Strait. Please. So thank you very much for letting me giving this uh, talk, and I could easily follow up with uh, Bruce's talk, uh, but focusing on, uh, on the Arctic. Um, because that is an area where there is very little ocean observations and as far as I know, there is little uh, warning systems in the Arctic. So maybe we could have some joint interest there. But this time I will focus on the work that we have been doing in the Frams Rate the last uh, 10 years together with the group uh, at the Scripps 
uh, Usan Graphic Institution and my colleagues at the Nansen Center. So the Arctic, as you know, it's changing. And as, uh, as uh, Bruce mentioned, the ice is melting on, uh, on Greenland, but also we see big changes in the sea ice. Uh, this is quite early in the, in the process, uh, but the multi-year ice is disappearing and it's only short lifetime ice left almost. It's just a small portion of ice, uh, multi-year ice uh, present here in this area. And you can see how it flows through the Fram Strait here between Svalbard and Greenland. Uh, and that is shaping most or quite a lot of the acoustic characteristics that you find in this area. So the Fram Strait is where the Atlantic Ocean meets the, Ar uh, the Arctic Ocean. And uh, in between you have the marginal ice zone, which is very uh, variable when it comes to the sea ice conditions. And it varies from year to year from uh, large sea ice uh, extent in the winter time and in the summer time there is less ice. Uh, and the marginal ice zone is also an area with high biomass production which leads, leads to a lot of marine mammals. Uh, and also, recently, we have seen that we can see a lot of uh, seismic uh, or seismicity activity in, in that area, but we don't know the, the baseline for seismicity in this region. So it's urgent to establish uh, uh, some benchmark data. So then I move to the ocean component. Um, you see on the left side uh, a model simulation, and I see if I can manage to, to start that um, ah, to start that uh, video. It's, it's not so important, but it could be nice to to show. So there is uh, three different uh, different water masses the warm water flowing into the Arctic on the eastern side, and then cold water coming out from the Arctic on the western side. And in the middle, we have a lot of recirculation and also a lot of uh, eddies and small scale uh, variability. And you can see that the, the Rossby radius is uh, between two to six kilometers, which is much less than in other regions and also uh, the mesoscale eddies is of uh, 20 to 40 kilometer size in diameter and it lives uh, for 20 to 30 days. So it will, if it occurs here, it will follow the current northward. And this complicates the acoustics. It's not an easy area and it's not easy for the modelers to model either with ocean models. Uh, and it's not easy to observe. So uh, as part of an EU project, we enhanced the, the monitoring system with um, um, acoustic tomography. Let's see. Ah. So we put up in Arcobar uh, a triangle uh, of acoustic sources, the green ones here, to support both tomography and, uh, and a kind of a first step to, towards an underwater GPS to navigate uh, gliders and, and also to gear position floats. Uh, and it was put uh, in integration with the uh, Usanographic Mooring Array uh, which has been ongoing since uh, the 1996. So I will focus now on the acoustic propagation uh, characteristics that we have learned from this and also on the, on, the, um, um, on the passive acoustics. 
So maybe just briefly, this is the source that we have used. This one, it sweeps from uh, 200 hertz to 300 hertz. This is a vertical array ser or a controller serving eight hydro hydrophones on uh, the section that I will talk about. Uh, and this is some, uh, some uh, modeling exercise that we have been doing uh, based on CTD data. So we created the, the mean here, and this is the um, um, objective mapping. So you can see the anomalies. Uh, this is plus with the red, and this is minus. So you have the warm water on the eastern side and the cold water here. And you have the receiver here. So we calculated the, the time fronts using a gum and ray, and they correspond <coughs> fairly well. This this is the water pond part of it, and this is, oops, and this uh, uh, later part here is the reflected ones, which I will show is the stable part. This one in the water will, of course, be influenced by the ozonography. Uh, here we compare the measured data with the model data. So the upper here is from the is um, output from the model going through pulse compression, beam forming, and estimator co correlator, the same procedure as the data down here. And you can see that we, we are able to identify some of the arrivals, but it's very much smeared out, and that is due to the small scale uh, variability in the fr uh, FRAMS rate. So A to D, uh, goes from here to the middle of the Fram Strait. It's in the middle of the Westbitsbergen current, and it gives you this, uh, this waterborne, messy arrival structure, and also the reflect, reflected part here. Uh, it's different when you come to the B to A, which goes through different, uh, different water masses. And this one is in the cold water. And you can see a similar but more narrow uh, bunch of uh, arrivals in the beginning and then the reflected field. Uh, this is after we have been uh, massaging the data or using the estimated colorator, correlator. So we are able to find some traceable <coughs> features in the signals also in the beginning of the uh, of the signal, uh, like for A to D and B to D, but here it's very hard because you go through uh, different water regimes. Um, yeah. Then we used the same data for passive listening. So you can see up here, uh, you have the, uh, the passive data plotted in colors, and then we have the uh, mooring motion, so you can see that it's correlated partly to the, to the mooring motion, which means that the, that data is not good. And you see also the difference between the mooring motion at A, which is at nearby the shelf, and this is uh, at D, which is in the middle of the front straight, and you can see this huge uh, movement of the uh, mooring. Uh, then we analyze the data to find out how much seismic noise comes from, uh, from uh, the Barents Sea and the North Sea. And you can see that most of the year you have seismic uh, air guns coming in into the data, and in particular in the summer time, on both locations, of course. And we went into the data and we looked into uh, uh, some summer data and you can see that the seismic is present on the whole array from 277, uh, 227 uh, and down to six, 614 meters. Uh, and at that time, uh, the the operations were in the Barents Sea and in the North Sea. You can see the black dots here. Then in the winter time, we found that sometimes under certain conditions, 
you can see that uh, we only get the seismic signal up in the near the surface and that is partly due to uh, the bathymetric effects here but it can it it's also related to that in, uh, in winter time you get a very cold, um, very cold uh, surface layer which is ducting the noise. So it disappears from the lower receivers and still much more visible here. And I guess that is uh, also relevant for, for what you are doing, that the, in the Arctic it's, uh, it's quite different uh, propagation conditions, so you may end up with uh, having a look at the array uh, configuration. Uh, this is just to show that we, we have also marine mammals in the Frams rate. Uh, you can see this big uh, peak here which is uh, referring to, the, to, for example, blue whale and also fin whales. Uh, and here we have removed all the seismics and all the uh, mechanical noise from the, from the mooring. Uh, but what is interesting is that uh, the, the whales start to disappear already in January, February, and in March, and then they are gone in April, May, and we, we really don't know if they go no, north or if they go south. So this year we will, next year we will put out a, size, um, a passive listening system north of Svalbard to see if we can see some uh, seasonal presence of, uh, of the bigger marine mammals. So to summarize my, the results, uh, the small gradients in the sound speed profile uh, that we, we have in the, in the Fram Strait causes the waterborne arrivals to come in very close in time and they are influenced also by, by the variability in the oceanography in the, in the Fram Strait. But we are able through processing to reveal some of the uh, traceable features uh, and we have used, or we, we plan to use that in the inversions uh, using the sensitivity uh, kernel. And then uh, the bottom reflected uh, arrivals are also well separated and stable and we also plan to look that into that in the inversion proce process because our goal in climate uh, monitoring is to get the temperature. And then most of the year you can see the significant air gun noise in the front straight. Uh, that is an issue when it comes to, to the marine mammals up there. Uh, and it comes usually from the Barents Sea or the North Sea. Uh, and it's very <coughs> driven by the bathymetry. Uh, during Certain days, as you saw, the, the air gun noise is only detected uh, on the upper res receiver. And also we see this, uh, this uh, seasonal presence uh, might be related to the seismics, but not necessarily. It can also be the, the food that comes and goes. So that was what I wanted to tell you about this, and if you have some more questions about what we plan to do in the Arctic, you are welcome to, to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sagan. <laughs> um, we have uh, time for a couple of questions, if anybody has. Yes, uh, one question regarding the mooring noise. Uh, does your mooring comprise of any chains or other mobile mechanical parts, or is this a continuous cable? Uh, it, it, during this experiment, we used uh, the first version of the STAR technology, uh, which is developed at Scripps, and they, they had, uh, uh, we had four cables, quite big cables, and this is a long, uh, long mooring, so that means that it, it was swaying quite a lot. Okay. Yeah, but in the new system that we have, we, uh, that has uh, been uh, removed more or less because we use um, uh, 
self-contained hydrophones on a wire. Okay. So we hope to reduce that. Thanks a lot. Any other questions? Uh, Albert Brower, uh, IDC, uh, SA. Um, so regarding the ergon noise, um, uh, these are seismic surfaces supposed by oil, co oil companies. Can you um, basically get the source data easily? Have you looked into getting the companies co to cooperate and give you GPS logs or such? No, it's, it's very hard to get data from, uh, from the oil companies. They have some data on, online, and you can also get something from uh, AI, uh, AAI. IAS, AIS. <laughs> uh, and combine that and, and use your, yeah, combine it and find out roughly where they have been. But I don't get the details. Thank you. Any other questions to Dr. Sagan? Otherwise, uh, thank you again. <laughs> and. <clears throat> Let us proceed to the next uh, contributing talk by David, Dr. David Dalosto. And the title of the talk is Directional Information from Signals Undergoing Hydroacoustic Blockage. Please. Hello, uh, I'm in from Seattle, Washington. Um, it's lovely here in Vienna. Um, and so I guess um, I'd like to just start off with uh, that I got into looking at CTBT data. Um, uh, the hydroacoustic networks. Uh, I've been in hydroacoustics for uh, over a decade um, because I was taking an investigator hat because I was interested in uh, some sound of the missing airplane that was uh, reported in the um, in the in the news. And I'll I'll hit on that at the end of the talk. But I discovered some very interesting effects um, that uh, propagation effects that we see on these hydroacoustic stations. So I'm going to focus on. Uh, three uh, hydrophone triads on two stations uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, one of these is located um, in the yellow box. Uh, let's see, is there a laser here? Right here uh, off Cape Lewin. Um, and that's a single uh, station uh, with three hydrophones. And then there are two stations here uh, at Diego Garcia, one on, uh, that covers this side of the Indian Ocean, and the other one covers the, the south side. And there's a big ridge that goes through here of shallow water. And in 2014, the North Station went inoperative. Um, and I think that's still being investigated to how to put that back online. Uh, but luckily, we have such a wealth of data here that we can look at data from the decade before that to do some comparisons. So this will be the study area uh, to investigate hydroacoustic blockage. And so here, uh, the main sources that I will be investigating are going to be uh, seismic sources that are generated on the Carlsberg Ridge here. This is actually named after, I Wikipedia this, uh, after a, a research cruise done by the, the owner of the Carlsberg Brewery. Uh, so they named it after him. And uh, there's quite a number of seismic events that happen here. And uh, here we have the Maldives, uh, quite a large population that's slowly going under the ocean as sea level rise happens. And we have then what looks like land, but actually a very reef-like area, uh, the Chagos Archipelago, uh, with Diego Garcia right there, where the arrow's pointed. And there's a, a base there where our, um, where our data comes into. And the two stations here, the North Triad and the uh, South Triad, are separated by about 200 kilometers. And so you can see that the line of sight uh, is affected uh, of the south station or the north station is affected by that shallow water. So here is a catalog of seismic events that happened on the ridge over uh, a little over a decade. And uh, I'll, I'll just pick out a few of these here, but this is just the wealth of data that we have to actually investigate uh, what happens when, when uh, sound crosses this ridge. Uh, here is uh, some work that was done uh, a little less than a decade ago uh, by uh, a few researchers um, at BBN. And uh, they have some works and posters I think they presented at, at similar um, conferences to this. And they show that when you're on the north side of the, of the island, there was an earthquake that happened right here. You have a nice big signal and less of a signal on the south side. 
and it, it, you have a drop in level, and actually the spectrum looks a little bit different. You lose some of that high frequency. So this motivated me to um, in, investigate this a little bit uh, deeper. So how can we record um, signals on the far side of an island uh, or through the shallow water? So there's a few um, um, acoustic effects that can be going on here. And uh, this acoustic keyhole idea, uh, I saw a talk um, that's um, by Bruce Howe's uh, colleague, uh, Rhett Butler, uh, just uh, last December. And he coined this term, so I wanted to give him uh, some, some credit. And they were res um, looking at data that was recorded at an observatory right off the Hawaiian Islands and looking at earthquakes that pass uh, through a line of sight right between the islands and looking at the frequency characteristics. Uh, quite an interesting study. Uh, and, that, and that idea that you don't have really quite a block path, you have a little bit of a, of a window there, a keyhole that the sound can go through. Now when we look at the actual propagation going through that keyhole, there's shallow uh, water on both sides of, the, uh, of that deeper channel, and the sound will refract away from the shallow water, so you actually get a spreading, um, so somewhat like light coming through a keyhole kind of spread out into a room. So you can see that a uh, much larger area than just a simple ray path, uh, kind of a, a blockage view. And then we have some elements of diffraction, which are not easy for me to depict with rays here. Uh, so I just show that some sound can come around the island, but that's going to be probably the lowest order um, sound that we will see. So the, block, uh, the main signals we record through a blocked um, path will be through some of that propagation through like a keyhole. So here is a, an example um, where we had all three stations operational of an earthquake. Um, and I have right here the red dot where the epicenter of the earthquake is. And this comes from a catalog of earthquakes, international database. And so we have a nice time and position of this origin. And if we look at the um, station here, this is the north station. Uh, it's unblocked, and we see this very strong uh, arrival. Uh, and it's coming in, in one piece. And then as we go to the south station, um, or let me jump here to the one that's six thousand kilometers away here in Cape Lewin. It's a very similar arrival. It's unblocked path coming right through that channel there. Well, the south station is uh, heavily influenced by this Ch Chagos archipelago, and you see it actually come in as a pair, and the frequency of these two are slightly different. And as you s try to compare, if you wanted to correlate with your eye, that this looks quite a bit like that, but these two are not necessarily identical to this. But if you go through the record, you see this appear every time that there's an earthquake in this region. And um, part of that, I did mention that the high frequencies are, are attenuated. So can we get some directional information? Um, and here's just a really basic way to get some directional information from the, the triads. If we are looking at, a, if we treat the acoustic wave coming in as a plane wave here, we can get a slight delay. Um, between one station and the other. And if you cross-correlate the two, you'll see a, a, a repetitive pattern um, that is um, repeating in frequency. So you can ask, actually estimate your arrival angle uh, between two stations. You could do this for all three pairs and uh, get a very precise um, measure. And for the unblocked uh, stations, we get uh, direction pointing right to the epicenter of the earthquake. So that was a good confirmation of this uh, processing. But when we look at the directional information within that block signal, uh, and there's a lot of noise here uh, not related to the event, so you have to, um, it's, it's harder to estimate that. Um, and I'll show an example of a, a much quieter uh, time period uh, just next. But you actually have two different um, scales here that show the first arrival coming in from what would either be the north or the south, since there, since there is an ambiguity in your um, in, in your estimate using this uh, two-station correlation, uh, but that can be resolved with another, another set of stations. And then the second rival coming in from, um, from the west there. And here's this little map, so you see that's coming in from this station. This guy sees the star, and these two are kind of coming in from around Diego Garcia to the left and above. So, can we do these type of detections when the North Station is not operable? And uh, this is now after the station has gone down on March 7th, 
And uh, this is getting close to the time period where I started looking at CTBT data. And uh, it's a very similar location, and it's a quite a large event. Uh, I don't show the magnitude here, but you see um, this clear uh, pattern of the in frequency, and that points right to the epicenter of the, of the source. Uh, and let's see if I can play this back here, just because I think it's kind of fun to listen to. CTB data sped up. right before this earthquake happened, uh, that very large event, there was something, I called it a whale song. I mean, it could be an iceberg scraping on the ground or something like that. that they make very similar sounds. But that's coming from a very different direction uh, than this event. And when we go back to the uh, block signal here, uh, it's a lot clearer here. You can see that there's two scales uh, where, these, where these directions are from. And it's maybe not surprising that the directions are very similar for that uh, same source location. So now that we've looked at the data, can we build up some model to actually explain what we're seeing here? Um, so I'm going to try to briefly go through this uh, just a bit on uh, deep water uh, sound propagation. We have the SOFAR channel, and that's why we put our hydrophones uh, into the middle of the ocean, because they're at a minimum where we'll have sound that's uh, refracted away from the high speed. And so we can actually measure sounds at really long distances, because it's not interacting with the surface or the, the seafloor where it will be attenuated. Um, here's just a map of the sound speed profile in this region, and it's pretty consistent uh, around this time of year. And uh, let's see. From this uh, ray-like picture where we have sound refracting, we can actually describe this as a, as in a mode. Uh, and the mode will have a maximum amplitude at the channel axis. And modes are very useful because you can look at this and say that if I have my receiver here, I will be most sensitive to that, uh, that sound energy. But also, where my source is uh, along this mode shape will be how well I can excite the mode. So if my source is on the bottom, uh, I will not excite that mode. And that is one of the uh, confusing parts about how do these earthquakes get into the water column, into the SOFAR channel. Uh, and you maybe could see some of that uh, in this uh, next slide where I show it as a function of depth. And uh, as the modes are... Um, either higher order modes or lower frequencies, the tails get longer, and so those will be more sensitive to the, um, the bottom, so it'll be easier to excite. So in deep water propagation, which I just showed, we have these T phases that I'm now assuming have been coupled into the, uh, the deep sound channel, and then uh, they propagate into shallow water where that uh, mode the modal tail there will start interacting with the bottom, and we actually will see an increase in attenuation. So here I'm showing that mode shape. You can see this first mode here. Uh, this is the, the deep water mode. It's not seeing the bottom. And as we get shallower here, so this would be uh, like a wedge, um, you can see that this mode shape starts getting more eccentric, uh, accent, uh, uh, accent, I uh, uh, can't say it, I'm sorry. Uh, but the, it sees the bottom much more. We have a lot of support there. So the idea here, if you had, let's say, an iceberg falling into the water uh, close to a shelf, that, that could easily couple into the SOFAR channel and, and propagate uh, thousands of kilometers. And at these low frequencies, the in-water attenuation uh, is so low uh, that we won't even see over 1,000 kilometers. You only see about a dB in reduction. Uh, this is a 4 hertz uh, study here. And uh, when you look at the phase speed, which is actually the interference um, uh, of the wave front. So if you have no interference, you'll have a constant phase speed. As you get into shallower water, you'll have a uh, refraction away from the, the shallow water and into the deeper water because it wants to go to the lowest phase speed. So how can we model this? Basically, we take the bathymetry and we can map that to a phase speed uh, and an attenuation so we make sure that we're not uh, tracing sound that wouldn't exist. And then we can either produce uh, rays, and that's where I've produced this um, a refraction out of the keyhole, uh, or we can use a numerical, uh, like a parabolic equation to include things like diffraction effects. And so here's a, an event right here, and you can see the, 
there's no sound really coming back, so the diffraction effects are very small here, very low amplitude, but we do have some beaming coming through. So just to zoom in on that um, here, um, we see that we have a lot of, uh, lot of sound coming in from lots of different directions on that far side when we have a blocked arrival. And now I'll just plot, play this real quick, or maybe, let's see, that mouse is running out of time. Maybe if I just drag through here. I just wanted to show that the angle changes as we go through different sources here. So I place sources at the X um, here, and I'm just going down the Carlsberg Ridge. And you see there's really not much uh, ambiguity on what the angle is on the unblocked station, as we had seen. But uh, there's a lot of confusing um, angles here. That's because we have some multipath interference in the simulation. So a, a more time-based, uh, time-dependent simulation will give uh, different arrivals at different angles. And that would just take a, a broadband simulation. You could do that quite readily. So I wanted to finish on the, what the signal was that I first looked at here, this blocked uh, propagation of an unknown signal. And this, this occurred just shortly after that last transmission from the missing uh, MH370 airplane. And uh, this didn't show up in the earthquake catalog. And it actually wasn't detected automatically on the CTVT network partly because there was an air gun survey um, going on here. Now at Cape Lewin, there was an event detected, and that's reported in a YouTube video uh, and lots of other places. Uh, but to be able to include a second station here, you can get it a, with an estimate of the source time. You can actually get a, a precise <coughs> position, and we can actually constrain it to know that it couldn't have happened in between the two stations since the travel time is, uh, is minimum uh, between the two. And we see this uh, dual arrival. Uh, and with in that cross-spectral uh, domain, you can see that coming in from those two angles. So I just wanted to cover that. Is it possible that that sound could have been the airplane? And splash noises, I think, are something that would be quite interesting to uh, look at, especially on this new station that we uh, have here on Crozet Island. Um, so when we have a, a calving event, some ice falling in the water, uh, we can actually look at some of the parameters of the uh, how fast it was going and how much kinetic energy it had and what its dimensions were and estimate what the spectrum would be. And here is a, just a non-dimensional curve put together by, uh, in the, uh, by dropping metal balls in water. And, but if you make it non-dimensional, you can scale this up. And if we look at that uh, a calving event here uh, with these parameters, a, I tried to look for the sound of rockets falling into the water, but I haven't found one yet. Um, because, and this probably makes sense when we scale it, it's pretty low amplitude. Or we take what would be, what would have a lot of kinetic energy, a very fast moving uh, airplane, which supposedly hit the water in this way, we would have quite a large low frequency signal. Um, so splash events can be heard uh, on the stations. And what splash events are, are more to be discussed. Um, but just to summarize here, um, we can hear sound on the far side of the island, even when there's no direct line of sight through a keyhole because of uh, refraction. And it appears that that actually does have um, some significant effects by changing the way the, the signal looks by splitting into two arrivals and two arrival directions. And so when half of the station goes offline, these block detections um, can be used to assist in localization because you actually can do some triangulation from two very far space stations. Uh, and new algorithms could be used to detect these block signals by both looking through the CTBT data and um, using models to actually just predict these at all the stations that don't have such seismic uh, sources. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I think uh, we should go to the next uh, speaker. And if any, anybody in the audience has any questions to uh, Dalosto, I'm sure that he'll be more than happy to answer them uh, in the break or later on. So, um, the next talk is by Dirk Metz, and uh, his talk is, start, is, is entitled Starting Submarine Volcanic Activity Using IMS Hydrophone Data, Detection and Implications for Ocean Noise. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to speak about um, submarine volcanic activity that is occasionally being recorded in the IMS network, 
I'm going to focus sort of on the intricacies of how one would, could possibly detect that. And then at the end, there is a brief slide on the implications that this might have for low frequency ocean noise. Um, so this is essentially the setup as it is. There is um, a relatively large submarine volcano in the northern Kermode Gark that is here marked with red triangle. It's called the Monowai Volcanic Center, or uh, for the sake of shortness, it's just Monowai. Um, it can be detected by broadband seismic stations in the Polynesian Sea, um, out of which one, uh, the one that features here is Rarotonga Station. Um, I've put it on here because we're gonna use it later um, to get a fix on the signal source location and because out of all the stations in the Polynesian Sea, it is the one that um, gets the clearest signal from the volcano. Um, we can also see it as, um, as hydroacoustic arrivals at the H03 and at the H10 station. Um, so we get a relatively clear hydroacoustic signal across the Pacific Ocean um, at Juan Fernandez Islands um, and at Ascension Island in the equatorial Atlantic Ocean. Um, I believe that the recordings at Ascension Island at about 16,000 kilometers uh, and the back azimuth of about 205 degrees um, is at the moment the record holder for sort of the longest range of a submarine volcano. Um, so for this talk, um, we're only going to focus on the northern array of Ascension Island. Um, the reason being here is that it has the, um, the so-called so most complete record. It's the only array um, out of the four arrays located at those two stations that has been uh, continually uh, been working for the last 11, 11 years or so. Um, the other reason why the Northern Array, um, or why I prefer to work on the Northern Array rather than the, the Southern Array, which would be located somewhere down here, is, is that the Southern Array gets a lot of ice noise from the Southern Ocean. And um, that ice noise is relative, uh, uh, it is being blocked out relative effectively by the bathymetry of Ascension Island over here, as we will see later on. Um, so how does it look like if a volcanic eruption sort of rolls through your uh, hydrophone recordings? Um, you can clearly see that something, something is going on here um, between, uh, yeah, let's say 7 p.m. On, on New Year's Eve in 2012 and uh, uh, four, 2 p.m. on New Year's Day 2013. Um, this is, in fact, one of the, the, the few moments where we have uh, sort of ground truth data on Monowai Volcano, um, because unfortunately we send um, a ship in to map the volcano about here at 6 p.m., and they try to swath map it, and then the volcano went off, and they had to run away relatively quickly. Um, if you'd like to see it later on, I do have a video of this. Um, it's not my video, so I'm not showing it here. But uh, if you want to learn some new German swear words, that's sort of uh, people shouting on board of a vessel. That's, that's the way to go. Um, you can see that most of the signals, they, they are confined to sort of the frequency range between sort of maybe 4 and 20 hertz, although some of them really go up to almost, almost 80 hertz here. Um, so maybe, maybe a brief word on volcanic activity in the context of the IMS processing. Um, obviously, the objective of the IMS monitoring system is not to find or detect submarine volcanoes. Um, so the system is not geared towards um, detecting these sort of very, very continuous, um, very high incidences of hydroacoustic phases. Um, in fact, if you look at the, um, at the reviewed event bulletin, for that time at that station, you will see that, that none of this, none of these arrivals in here uh, pop up in there. The reason simply being that um, an event is only associated if there is a seismic phase connected to it, and these are purely hydroacoustic. So if you, if you go back sort of in the processing, processing levels at the, at the International Monitoring System, you will find uh, a few dozen arrivals in the SEL3 um, catalog, which are then not being associated to a seismic event, so they, are, they, they don't make it to the, to the event bulletin list. Um, you can also see that the signals vary greatly in duration, in frequency, and in magnitude, so there's really no point in using anything 
that uses a short-term, long-term trigger to, to, to look at these sort of, sort of signals. We have, to, we have to find something else. So we either have to find something that is way more sophisticated or, or way simpler. And uh, because I'm not smart enough for more sophisticated things, um, I'm, I came up with something simpler to look at this. Um, so so how, can we, how, can we, how can we quantify the observations that we're making here? So we're starting off again with, with our spectrogram up here. And um, instead of do, taking the event-based approach, which, which look for individual hydroacoustic phases, I'm simply binning the data to one-minute windows, and then I bandpass filter everything between 4 and 12 hertz, because that's where I expect the signal-to-noise ratio would be best. Um, the RMS um, amplitude you can see here, that is calculated over one minute window, so you can see up nice, nicely here how it goes up as the volcano goes off and how it goes down as it, as it stops around here. Um, and then you can see the, the mean cross-correlation coefficients between the pairs of hydrophones. And obviously as they go up as well, as, um, as more coherent phases arrive at the Ascension Island, at the Ascension Island array. Um, you can also see um, a ship passing by. This is the classic sort of bathtub feature over here. So there's where it approaches, then it disappears behind the island, and then it comes back on the other side. Um, so what we then do is, in order to get a quantitative handle on this thing, is um, we, we bin it to the, to the one-minute windows, um, high-pass filter between 4 and 12 hertz, and then we run a plane wave fitting inversion to see where the angle is coming from and at what speed it crosses the array. So we have three hydrophones and um, two unknowns, which is the, the velocity and the back azimuth. So we can invert for that, and we even get an error estimate, um, which I've done here. So you can see how everything nicely sort of stabilizes in the sulfide channel, around 1,480 meters per second, and uh, how most of the activity at the, during the volcanic eruption forms this really distinct band here um, at about 205 degrees is where it, that's exactly where we would expect it to be. And we can sort of see the ship going by down here as well. And what we then do is um, we simply apply some cutoff values. So we only use those one minute windows that have a mean cross correlation coefficient, which is higher than 0 0.33, um, which is roughly the noise floor. Um, and then we can, we, can, uh, we can use 15 meters as an error cutoff for the one minute windows up here at the sound speed, and we throw away everything that has an error that is larger than 0 0.5 degrees. So we can see, you can see here that those values probably make sense, but the, 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 the standard errors here, the 15 meters per second and the 0 0.5 degrees, you can calculate these from some empirical formula and, and then apply them. Um, so once we do that, we're left with what I call our detections. Um, which essentially is reduced to the volcano here and the ship noise, um, which apparently comes in from around, uh, yeah, this must be north, northeast, and then the volcano from south, southwest down here. Um, now that we've sort of translated our observation in some quantifiable unit, um, obviously the idea was to check when this volcano goes off and sort of use the entire data set to, to constrain an eruptive record. Um, and the way you can do this is, is, is using cluster analysis. So what we do here is I'm zooming in now on only the back azimuth, only the detections between 200 and 210 degrees. So this is plus minus five degrees where we would ex the ex volcano expect to be. And in the in the blue square here, this is, this is the eruption we've just been looking at. And we can already see that something's going on beforehand here. There's two sort of very dense clusters of points and two, two clusters um, later on. Um, and what we then use is called the DB scan clustering algorithm. DB scan stands for density based um, spatial clustering analysis with noise. And, um, it's just a very neat way of picking up those clustered points in a, in a data stream. Um, so we define a search radius. The whole thing only really needs two parameters. It needs a search radius and uh, the minimum number of points that we would like to see in a cluster. Um, the search radius here 
translates into 12 hours on the x-axis and into 0 0.5 degrees on the y-axis. And uh, the minimum numbers of points in a cluster, I define those as 60. So we need 60 very coherent arrivals from the same angle over 12 hours for one cluster to be formed. Um, if we do that, we can see here that we end up with exactly the five clusters that we would have also uh, probably picked out just by eye, just by looking at the data. Um, now the okay. Now the question, the question here is, um, how can we make sure those signals really come from Monowai? After all, the the, the source receiver range is 16,000 kilometers, and maybe there is an iceberg drifting around somewhere in the Southern Ocean. And because we're not doing any frequency analysis here, uh, we're just looking at the cluster points. We can't really exclude the fact that. Um, maybe an iceberg is kind of masking as, as a submarine volcanic eruption. So something that I did is um, I calculated the envelopes, and this is where the Rarotonga seismic sta station comes back in up here in black. And I calculated the envelopes for the broadband seismic stations, which is quite close to the volcano. Um, well, quite close here means about 2,000 kilometers. And in blue here is the hydrophone recordings for the same time that we've seen before. And in sort of sky blue, that's, that's the detections that, that we made using our algorithm. And then we just cross-correlate these. And we find that the cross-correlation coefficient is uh, minus 158. And um, uh, the cross-correlation coefficient is 0 0.8 at 158 minutes. That's exactly what we would expect. So we do this for the entire data set. And we end up with loads of clusters. And obviously, that opens up some possibilities for a logical perspective here, um, when does the volcano go off? What is sort of the time in between? Um, we can see that the most busy year was probably 2009 at the end of 2014. Um, and now if we take, if we take all of the, of the events that we detected at that station, we can see that Monowai makes up about 6% of those one minute windows, if we look at the whole zero to 360 degree frequency range, um, there's half of the data is actually seismic noise coming from the western margin of Africa. If you wonder why, um, you can see it here. Um, so a lot of commercial seismic surveying, all of these points down here, they essentially look like this. Um, so there's not really a single day of this two-year record here, 2012, 2013, that doesn't have, any, have seismic recordings in it. So I'm, I'm, running, I'm running out of time. So I'm, I'm going to summarize here. We found 158 episodes of volcanic activity. That adds up to about 121 days, about the 10, day 11-year record. Um, we could obviously expand that approach uh, to other stations. And um, uh, so H03, H11, maybe looking at the Isobon and Mariana arc volcanoes there. And the implications for test and monitoring um, are, re um, I would say, uh, concern mostly the detection capabilities because when the volcano erupts, it raises the RMS levels by about four decibels. That's it. Thank you. Th thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Metz. And I'm sure if you have any questions, uh, Dr. Metz will be willing to answer those questions if you meet uh, later on. Thank you. So uh, we almost done a full circle, not in terms of papers, but in terms of presenters. And it's again a pleasure to yes. welcome yes. Professor Caneda yes. for the final talk in this uh, morning session. And the title is Modular Design Architecture of Donut Seafloor Observatory Network. Thank you, Simon. So the, uh, I'd like to talk about the modular design architecture of the Donut Seafloor Observation Observatory Network. So uh, this is the content of the Donut system and the uh, construction of the Donut 2. So I'd like to show the uh, uh, Donut array again. This is a Donut 1, Donut 2. Already Donut 1 is already a deployment. I would like to show that today uh, the, the how to construct the DUNET 2 so using the totally uh, 29 uh, uh, observatory plus 2, the total is uh, 31 observatories. This is uh, just a DUNET 2. Next slide. 
this is a, uh, the uh, equipment of the DoNet uh, system. Uh, they're using the uh, node system, science node system. This is just, this is a backbone, uh, the cable system, and the sensor system. This is a, a, a terminal unit. This is a terminal unit, uh, the branching unit, and the uh, repeater, uh, and uh, submarine cable here. So this is just the uh, equipment to do the system. This is a, uh, uh, the outline of the uh, backbone cable system. Next slide. I would like to do the uh, uh, science uh, sensor system here, here. This is a backbone. This is a, oh, too quickly, <laughs> just a moment. Ooh. This is the sensor system, I, I, including the uh, seismometers, the pressure gauges, and the hydro, hydrophones, and the uh, uh, some meters. And the seismometers are, are buried in the, uh, under the sea floor, and the uh, pressure gauges is uh, on the sea floor here. Next slide. Uh, this is a sensor system. The sensor system is a consists of the science node, uh, extension cable, the pressure gauges, and the uh, uh, seismometers. A science node is an extension cable, a seismometers. It, you can see this one. The pressure gauges package is uh, around here. Next slide. This is a, 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 the sensor system. This is a science node. The port is a totally the eight port. And actually, the, we already use the only a half, the four ports to extend the uh, observatories. This is uh, just uh, the uh, uh, outline of the DoNet system. So, uh, the <coughs> next slide. So, this is a, a measurement of the instru instrument of the uh, composed of the pre precise seismometer, the tsunami uh, meter, uh, to observe the small and large earthquake, uh, slow sleep, uh, for instance, for the slow sleep events on the plate boundary and the tsunami uh, and the tsunamis. The seismometer is buried in the seabed and uh, uh, reduce the noise. It's very, very important, especially the broadband seismometer is very, very uh, sensitive to the uh, uh, frequency, uh, noise, uh, low frequency noise. So the buried uh, system is very, very important. So next slide. This is a, a science node extension cable uh, the, from the node to the uh, sensors at a maximum 10 kilometer uh, length uh, the using the ROV, yes. I would like to sh uh, show you the, some uh, the, uh, uh, operations, uh, the, you, how to uh, extend the uh, extension cable using the robin, bobbin uh, of the uh, ROV. Next slide. The, this is an extension cable. It's very thin, so the specification, <coughs> specification is an outer diameter of 6.15 uh, millimeter. The cable breaking the rod is uh, this one. And the cable robbing is a maximum, maximum is a 10 kilometer cable. So a uh, more long extension, we uh, try to one and uh, one again. So next slide, ROV operation in the construction. The instru installation of the sensor system is uh, of, uh, using the ROV and uh, uh, backfilling the seismometer. Next slide, this is uh, uh, the ROV, uh, the uh, hypertrophy of jam stack here. This is a, uh, the science node, and this is a, a, a terminal unit. Terminal unit and the science node. How to connect the, uh, the, this uh, uh, using the extension cable? This is <coughs> Next is uh, uh, the seismometer, uh, maintenance, transport, ponder, the pressure sensor packages, and the external battery packages here, this one. Next slide. Uh, this is a cable airline uh, operation using an ROV. So uh, probably the many uh, the, uh, network using the ROV here, like this. So this is an automatic cable line control. Yes, this is uh, using a sub. Oh, the, this is a, a ground speed. This is the angular speed and the controller. This is a, just uh, the uh, developed 
、えー、と場合でジャムステック、えーえー、リサーチャーズ、ジャストナス。<笑>ユキャスイダー、ディスイズカメラ、アンダーディスイズロビン、トゥエクステンサー、エクステンションケーブル、ディスイズジャスト、エザオートマチカル、ペイロードバイダー、マニュアルオペレーション、ペイロードバイダー、アングルアタシープ、ヤディスイズジャスト、ダー、ハウトゥエクステンサー、ザエクステンションケーブル、ザビトゥイン、サイエンスノートゥデセンサーズ。The conclusion is, is, uh, is uh, from the uh, 2030, the, the development of the DUNET was uh, started. And finally, the,、uh, in the, uh, completed in the 20, uh, 2060. Uh, this is、uh, totally the 29 of,、uh, measurements, and plus two, totally is 31 observatories measurements. So, next slide. This is a survey,、uh, to press survey uh, to uh, uh, determine to the、uh, cable route. This is just a do net cable route, backbone cable route here. Before、uh, deplo deployment of the、uh, uh, do net two,、uh, of the uh, back backbone cable was do net two. So we had to survey and modify the. Route、uh, to check the more carefully. So, this is just the uh, uh, snapshot of the、uh, survey. This is very, very important for the long term observation. This is a, a, a construction of the back backbone cable system line so using the、uh, cable ships. Yes, this is a, uh, just uh, the snapshot around here. This is a caisson installation. The, the seismometer is a, is a valid in Venice in the sea floor. It, I, we used the,、uh, the caisson here. And、uh, it is not so easy to install the caisson in the Venice、uh, sea floor. So, this is an installation of the procedure of the seismometers. Yes, this is a caisson in the here. But、uh, not easy. But、uh, sometimes we had to,、uh, this one, how to do? So we developed a c i f r o hammer, yes, a hydraulic hammer, yes, to uh, uh, install the Venice、uh, c i f r o c i f r o It's just a、uh, development by the jam stick here. Next slide. This is a, just a snapshot of the already after the uh, uh, installed caissons. Yes. And in the caissons,、uh, we, all, all, we, we, we、uh, install the seismometers in the caissons. Yes. Next slide. This is a how to extend one and one more to extend.、Uh, sometimes we need to 10 kilo,、uh, 20 kilometers the,、uh, from the science node to the Sensors. So we try to again and again. <laughs> so this is just、uh, the extension cable line at the,、uh, the, this one. This one's the same. Next slide. I would like to show you the how to. Before、uh, <laughs> deployment, we already check、uh, the,、uh, the inland. This is a SAT the before the、uh, totally the test of the、uh, SAM system. This is a cable. This is a branch unit. Repeater. Yes,、uh, extension cable and the science node. This one. Yes, quickly.
more? Yes. Checking the sensors and uh, uh, the boarding uh, the systems. This is a uh, uh, the connect the from the ocean uh, offshore to the onshore. They using the vertical hole and the horizontal hole to uh, defect, uh, detect the typhoon uh, the damage. The cable uh, installation here. Yes. Mm. This was quickly. Uh, sometimes uh, the rough uh, sea uh, uh, conditions. It's similar to the the eight eight o four. No. <laughs> okay. This one. Yes. Okay, just uh, quickly. Uh, finally, we uh, used uh, the uh, ROV. Uh, the water depth is about uh, here, 1,300 uh, meters. How to install the uh, seismometer? This is in the case on. Next slide. Oh, no, no, no. I quickly. OK. Uh, this is uh, uh, just the how to uh, uh, construct the DUNET 2. So I would like to show you the, uh, these technology will be applied to the uh, uh, CTBTO uh, stations construction. So I, I would like to uh, close my talk. Probably time is over. Yes, uh, thank you very much yes, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Kaneda. I think this last talk here concludes the morning session. And I think we should thank all the speakers for very interesting and uh, inspiring content in the talk. So thank you very much. Thank you. And now um, I would like uh, to present the posters that uh, are in our session really quickly. And uh, I would like to um, invite uh, Matsumoto-san for the one minute introduction of his poster. And yes, please. And thank you, George. Uh, my name is Hiroyuki Matsumoto, a uh, former cost free expert of International Monitoring System of CTBTO. Uh, in this study, uh, we are focusing on the uh, International Monitoring System hydroacoustic hydrophone stations data obtained during the tsunami genic earthquakes. Uh, in the first part, uh, we uh, estimate the uh, direction of arrival of T phase traveling around the so far channel access, for which uh, we propose three-step uh, data processing technique so that the seismic FK analysis would be applied. Then uh, we are also addressing the tsunami itself uh, over, uh, passing over the hydrophone triplets. And it uh, shows that the uh, dispersive signals can be identified in the recordings. Overall, the both results are very interesting, so let's get together and discuss in the afternoon of the session. Thank you very much. So the, the second poster is uh, a summary of the installation of the hydroacoustic station at uh, Crozet. 
Uh, you can find it at the poster area, but also at the H04 exhibition exhibition room. And uh, basically, what I would like to stress here that there were three CTBTO teams working in different places. One was the installation team on the on board of the cable ship, the shore team on the on the island, and uh, the data quality team here here in Vienna. Um, with that, also. Um, um, I would like to say that there is another poster by our uh, contractor, uh, MariPro, titled Risk Management and Program Execution. We don't have a one-minute presentation for that, but I would like to invite uh, um, Guy Cicada to from MariPro to um, provide an introduction to that poster here. Talk over, talk over this one. Good morning. Uh, my name is Guy Chikata. I work for L3 Maripro. As Giorgio, yeah, as Giorgio has mentioned, uh, we're the subcontractor that actually installed all six uh, hydrocone uh, stations. And this poster basically summarizes the, the different projects, but really focuses on Crozet. And as a program manager, what I was responsible for is actually having risk management plans throughout each phase of the design, manufacture, and installation of the project. So that's what the poster goes into detail on, and I look forward to discussing that with you guys. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, the next, the next poster is by Dr. Brower, please. Uh, it's titled Exploiting Recent Plentiful Detections on HO3 and HO, HO11. Hi, uh, I'm Albert Brower. I work for the uh, IDC, the uh, software application section, and we became aware that there were many uh, detections in the uh, database in, in November and also earlier um, this year, November last year as well. And we looked into that, and with some specialized uh, detection algorithm, we could actually locate the events off the coast of Chile. And of course, then the question is, what is it? And it, it looked like the seismic survey conducted by a ship. And after some searching around and detective work, we, we figured out it was a survey conducted using an LDEO official, uh, Le Monde uh, Earth Observatory. And we got the shot logs, that is the times and the positions of the uh, shots of the air gun array. And that gave us a very rich set of ground truth with which to assess the performance of our detection algorithms, and in particular also to um, figure out what is going on with them, because we saw some artifacts in the database. And if you want to learn more about it, please visit my poster. It's, um, what is it? It's in, it's in the Fetzal. 1.4 yeah. P3. Yeah. Thank you very much, Albert. Thank you. <laughs> OK, the next one is by Dr. Sassanou. Please. Thank you. I'm not a doctor yet. I'm just. Okay, a... well, soon you will be. <laughs> Thank you. This poster uh, presents um, a series of uh, repetitive coherent signals that were recorded at the uh, Diego Garcia IMS station in the Indian Ocean. They peak at around uh, 105, 108 uh, hertz, which uh, means that they could possibly be of biological origins because they fall into the range of known um, um, baleen whales uh, vocalizations. Uh, Cross-correlating signal traces at both the northern and the tri southern uh, triads, um, we obtain peak delay times, which uh, then can be used to determine uh, the direction of the emitting source. This means that um, IMS hydroacoustic data can be possibly used uh, to um, identify and monitor uh, species migration in the ocean. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Zampoli will present progress in the studies on the next generation cabled IMS uh, hydroacoustic station poster. Thank you. So this poster will present uh, the state at which we are on a project that has uh, been going on since a couple of years, but we have done a lot of work last year with a study on the next generation cabled hyd IMS hydroacoustic stations. The question uh, the fact here is that, uh, well, our network is complete. In 19th of June, Crozier was uh, certified. Um, and 
the stations have all, all share the similar uh, reliable uh, linear design concept with three hydrophones connected in a linear string. And uh, you can see here where the stations are distributed. They are the white age ones around the world. Um, however, some of these stations now are approaching their design life, and as we have already heard in the other presentations, there are hydrophone triplets which have had issues. And so the question that one asks themselves naturally is, what will the next generation IMS hydrophone stations look like? And uh, the, this study that we conducted with the team from APL as contractors to investigate different options and different design concepts uh, led us to think that adopting modular components very similar to those used in ocean observatories and presented in other talks during this session can improve the underwater systems, especially repairability and long-term su sustainability in the sense that in a design like this you might be more forced if one of these components breaks to repair, recover the whole thing and replace it and we're looking at whether one can now, with the new technology, have reliable and durable designs where in case of any uh, inconvenience, you can actually intervene on a single component and do a replacement. So look forward to presenting that and discussing that with anybody who's interested. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next one. Uh, hello, everyone. But, uh, hello, Dimona. Uh, my name is Lyubo Dimova. I'm a PhD student in Sofia University, Bulgaria. I have the opportunity to work with the Tsunami Research Team from University of Bologna. So uh, we will present some numerical simulations of uh, tsunami waves generated by earthquakes in the region of uh, Western Black Sea. Uh, we take into account three different seismic sources. Uh, our calculations are performed using uh, three different grids with uh, different resolutions. So I will show you the generation mechanisms, the propagation of the tsunami waves, impact on the coast, and some other features like velocity fields and inundation. So if you're interested, poster 8 at Fistal. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Dimova. And just to make sure, is Mr. Hakim in the room or Mr. Yeti Mantoro? No, there was another post of P4, but it's, it's an, an off show. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that I, you know, we can see you back at one o'clock here where we have the three um, presentations on uh, Crozet. Enjoy your break. Thank you so much. <laughs>